Hello, my name is Tygen Henderson, and I'm a Zen Buddhist. Some of you might uh, recognize those words uh, because they actually come from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> In the perspective of Buddhism, we're all addicts. We're all addicts of our egos. We're all addicted to this sense of self, a personal separate sense that stands apart from the world. And it, therein lies the problem. It's very similar to what my colleagues have been saying. And when we see this, this ego, this, uh, from the ego from the Buddhist sense, is this sense of separation from the world, which actually doesn't exist. There isn't any separation. So when you talk about the oneness of God, oneness of creation, you're, we, we have different names, true nature, Buddha nature. We're talking about that's the actual state of things. But our mind, our intellect, our conceptual thinking divvies it up. It's like our onboard computer. Those of you who's, who know computer technology, back in the early days, it's a binomial system, you know, zero and one. It just needs two things. And then out of that, those two possibilities come the infinite variety that is the world and our intellect and our understanding and everything. So when we see things from a divided sense, and the, the core of the division is me standing apart from everything else. When we look at it from that way, everything is divided. We're all divided. We're all separate. Even in churches, we're separate from this sector, that sector, or whatever, let alone sex from each other or, or face from each other. So when you look at it from that perspective, everything is separate. Everything is individual, and it's every man for himself, and we're all, you know, it's, you know, the, the bottom feeders and the, you know, the top feeders. This is the, this is an incorrect way of seeing, basically. It's, in Buddhism, this is called ignorance. It's incorrect. It's, it's, it's seeing things the wrong way, because actually we are interdependent. We're completely interdependent. And it's great. Nowadays, science and religion and, and all, of these, all of these faiths and all of these understandings are all coming together to see this as an understanding, even if it's just intellectual. So this is, you know, back in the, uh, well, we're all, look like many of us are from the 60s. We used to say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And uh, this part of the problem is seeing ourselves as separate. And so we really need to see that part and in order to become aware of it and in order to get <laughs> beyond it. We have to acknowledge it in ourself, see our self-centeredness, see our, 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 our selfishness, and find ways of getting beyond it because the self always wants to do things for the self. And sometimes it's the small self, but sometimes it's, uh, you know, we attach ourselves to a, a faith and it's, we, we do the same thing on the basis of our faith that we do for ourselves. We're completely selfish for our faith, for our, sometimes it's on the basis of a country. And so then we do things for our country that we wouldn't actually do as individuals. And so, so basically, it's sort of like ego transferred ego. And so we have to see these, these different <coughs> forms of ego, these different forms of separation. All life is sacred. All life is one. You know, when we see it from that perspective, when we look for differences, we see differences. When we look for sameness, we see a lot of sameness. There's a lot of unity. And because that's actually the way things are, truly. Unity is the foundation of life. It was always that way. You know, on a biological perspective, and even in, a, well, we're part of the biological perspective. So, <coughs> seeing in Zen, at least, the perspective, the, the emphasis is on trying to see this unity, trying to understand, trying to have direct connection with your, your spirituality. In order to do this, we have to get beyond this thinking, conceptual way of understanding the world. And so that's what our training is. The, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the training in Zen is practical training. It's, it's very pragmatic, very down to earth. Uh, we 
there are scriptures that are that basically uh, um, support this kind of way of seeing, but in Zen at least, it said Zen is beyond scriptures, and what that means is is that within each person, you can say there is their true nature, their God nature, their spiritual nature, whatever you want to call it, their divine nature, and each person is capable of of getting in contact with that nature, and that is the nature of everything, and that is the basis of morality. That's the basis of ethical behavior. The basis of ethical behavior, when it's put on from the outside, it becomes problematic because it, it's thinking that we're good, thinking we're doing right. And of <coughs> course, I can think I'm doing right and you can think you're doing right, and if we don't agree, then we're going to have a little fight or maybe a big fight, you know. And so, so basically, it's, it, it's, it's our common bond. It's this, you know, faith in the common good. It's the golden rule. It's that seeing the oneness of humanity, seeing, being empathetic, understanding things from, from this basis. We need to experience this as human beings, basically. Otherwise, we can't act out of it, of our intellect. The intellect is what causes the problem in a lot of ways. If the intellect is in conjunction with it, then it works together very well. Right livelihood is one of the uh, principal tenets of the Eightfold Noble Path. There's eight, I'm not going to go through them. <laughs> but right livelihood is one. And traditionally, that meant it was actually framed in a way of not doing things that can cause harm to other things. But it's, it's, more, it's more deep than not doing harm. It's actually doing things properly. And doing things properly means not wasting. There's a lot of stories in Zen centers and Zen monasteries at least. Uh, you know, when they have a meal, they have these bowl sets and you know, you never waste anything. You, you're taught not to waste anything. <coughs> you eat everything that you, you're given and, or that you take and you take every, everything that you take you eat. And you clean up after yourself leaving no traces. Leaving no traces means taking care of the environment. So when you leave, it looks better than when you came. T totally taking care of every detail, paying attention. Paying attention is, is, is key. We have to raise our awareness away from our self, our small self, to awareness of everything. And so that itself is a practical uh, a way of working. There's an old story of a Zen master. There's an old story of a Zen master who he saw a cabbage floating down. Uh, he was going to look for a Zen master, a monk, and he saw this cabbage floating down the stream as he was climbing the mountain, and, and then another cabbage leaf. And he thought, "Oh, I'm going to the wrong place, because there's no Zen master that would waste anything." He turned to to walk away from to go back down the mountain, and then he saw the Zen master running after and diving into the water to grab the cabbage leaf. And he thought, "Aha! I'm at the right place." <laughs> not wasting anything. And one of the things we can't waste is our time. We don't want to waste our time here on Earth or waste our time with each other. We have a limited amount of time, each one of us, to, to do what we can do. We have to be able to see the things that are needed and respond to them. And in, in, in a Zen Center, we train our, ourselves to get beyond our ego we have actually these practical things, like when you go and have a shower, you just get yourself wet, you turn off the water. You soak down, you turn on the water and rinse. Use a tiny amount of water using that way, instead of just standing under the shower. So people do this when they come to retreat. When they're in retreat in a, in a Zen center, you learn pra practically how not to waste, how to turn lights off after you've left. So this is part of the practical training. Part of the uh, also, one of the, the foundations is uh, right speech. And right speech and means not speaking against each other. And I think this is a really important one when we come together as large groups. I see so many groups where they all fall down because they start bickering or talking down the other people. And I try and make a really strong emphasis in my teaching not to say anything against any tradition because they're all viable ways of transformation, and each one of them is important for the people that are in that tradition. 
And so, you know, you see all of these good organizations, but they, they end up imploding because of the infighting, because people are, it's ego again. People are trying to <coughs> levy each other for the higher moral stance. They want to be in the highest moral stance. And so we try to, to emphasize not talking against each other and rather seeing ourselves as a world community, part of a world community, part of this organism of the earth. And, you know, we're all, we all need each other. And we, you know, what can you say? It's the difference that makes it interesting. 